to see some incredible historical sites in my time. I'm gonna look out for these uh, different vibes and all that sorts of things. I'm, I'm a bit curious to see what the differences are. The expansion in your perspective and worldview, the empathy you gain from people. And there's one cool thing about poker is it takes you to all these crazy places. Okay, I'm gonna go play a tournament in Spain, but there's also a couple of countries next door that I've never been to. I think it's a better way of doing things for sure, but you know, What's up guys? Today we've got a very special guest, one of the most unique personalities in poker. Uh, a Quite a successful tournament professional as well, and one of the classiest uh, players in poker, and also the host of the WPT, Tony Dunst. What's going on? Hey Dan, how's it going? Um, it's uh, interesting on my end. I'm in India. Uh, you're on the West Coast, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, I'm in Las Vegas. So what are you up to do these days? It feels like I've seen you a lot in the tournament uh, uh, the tournament scene. I guess you're playing a lot of the WBTs and also, yeah, how's uh, hosting, the sh um, hosting them going? Well, it's been great lately. Uh, we've kind of expanded coming out of the pandemic and now have a bunch of events, both globally and domestic. Um, we've also kind of added to our roster of talent. So while I've been traveling, there's also been more people on staff that we spread across the events. Um, you know, in particular, we brought on uh, Andrew Neve and Brad Owen. Uh, they've been awesome additions to the team, and they're really engaged in everything that we do. Uh, I've continued to play a ton of tournament poker, a mix of online and live throughout this uh, period. And uh, my, my main kind of like hobby and focus, I guess, during the last couple of years has just been playing tons of tennis. So I've been, been like lining up tennis matches against all the people in poker that take the sport seriously and, and have another one today against David Benefield I'm real excited about. Oh, really? Uh, mm -hmm. So why uh, tennis? And my first thought is, have you played Patrick Antonius? No, I think I need to work my way up to playing Antonius. I think he would almost certainly be like a, the, the top of the tennis poker mountain right now, especially judging from his uh, match with Brandon Adams 10 years ago when they had that bet where Antonio's laid him like 10 to one or whatever it was. And then just kind of, you know, and Adams is from what I hear, a fantastic tennis player himself trained really hard for that bet and then just got obliterated by Antonio. So I haven't played him. Um, I don't think I'm on that level yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, as to why tennis, I, I grew up playing it, um, but kind of quit in high school and then like didn't really play very much at all for the next 10 to 15 years. And when the pandemic hit, I thought that I needed a way to stay outdoors, stay active, stay social. And that really hit the criteria nicely. Um, plus, it's a game that's very difficult and it takes a ton of practice to get any good at it. And I really appreciate that element. There's like such levels to it. Um, that I enjoy obsessively practicing something. Okay. Are you uh, going to make any money with it by any chance? Are you going to like be on TV shows or host TV shows in tennis? Is your, um, I'm curious if there's any kind of crossover between poker and tennis or your, just your career in tennis, or course, it's just like a strong hobby of yours. No, just a strong hobby, actually. Like a lot of people create tennis bets and I feel like I would not perform well under that. Like I already have some degree of yips when I go out and play a match that I'm like really looking forward to or really want to win. So I think I would be a terrible money player for tennis. And I, I really don't have uh, much interest in expanding my, my broadcasting career outside of poker. So really it's just like a hobby that I take very seriously. Okay. Okay. I was like tempted a little bit to, or at least did I, Personally, would have wanted to see a Tony uh, bet versus or some kind of betting line uh, on tennis. So me and uh, some friends have bet on some stupid things while betting. We bet on like people. Um, an example would be in Macau, there would be like mm -hmm. a race. Uh, like a ra there'd be a race between True Teller and this other guy right. uh, named Craig who was super jacked. And uh, we lay some lines on that kind of stupid stuff but uh, i think that stuff is fun but whatever uh whatever you prefer um okay that's interesting 
Can you tell us a bit about how you got into poker? Uh, why, any specific reason why tournaments? Um, I mean, it, it seems like your way of evolving from all that. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Why don't you start with like the beginning of your career? I mean, I got started back in high school playing online before Moneymaker even won the main event. So this was like the genesis of online poker back then when the only televised poker we had at that point was like Robert Barconi winning the 2002 main event when they weren't even showing whole cards. So it was a completely different era. Um, my main motivation for getting into poker was both like I thought it could be an interesting career. I thought it could be you know profitable, lucrative, and I thought it could be a really interesting lifestyle. It could give you a chance to like travel the world, and have adventures, and meet interesting people. And um, I'm fortunate to say that that part of the poker ambition was was realized. Like I got to live all of that stuff out that my 17, 18 year old self wanted to do. So I'm always very grateful to have found poker when I did. Yeah, I saw you like went to China. You moved to China with your girlfriend. Uh, mm -hmm. That's pretty wild to live in China. And then you're originally from Australia. No, I lived down there for like five years. Is what it happened was I, I won like a trip down there playing on party poker in my dorm room, and I went down there, and that's where I met uh, the ex girlfriend that I moved to China with when I was uh, accidentally banned from Australia for a while because I overstayed my student visa. And then I got back into Australia and stayed there for years and tried to immigrate. That didn't work out. Um, and then even for a while, I was like living out of a suitcase, just traveling the poker circuit for like three, four years. I mean, I had just basically had no residency for almost four years uh, from about like 29 to 33 or something like that. So I, I really got to maximize the travel element of tournament poker. That's very uh, interesting. Um a shift in lifestyle. I mean, Australia sounds a lot like, seems a lot like the U S from it is. myself being there. And then, mm -hmm. and then China is just a completely different world, especially if you uh, don't speak Chinese, which I guess you don't, I don't know what the situation is there. And then, yeah, not a word. It is, it's disorienting because I couldn't speak the language. I didn't have any friends outside of my ex-girlfriend. I didn't really have like any social life. We were living out in the middle of nowhere where they didn't have any white people at all. Like we were in Shanghai, but we were like very much on the outskirts of Shanghai. So when I went outside, I was a fascination. Like I was just stared at. I would be asked for pictures. Um, it was basically like being famous in a way just because I remember the first time we went into the market around the corner and the place just came to like a screeching halt. Like we walked in and just everything stopped and people would just stare for like 30 seconds. because oh, the white guy. Right. You know, when I went into downtown Shanghai, nobody, nobody gave a crap, you know, that I, some foreigner was there. But in that part of Shanghai, it was just like so unusual. It was, uh, it was very eye opening for the locals. Um, so, yeah, that part was disorienting. Of course, a very different culture, very different customs, very different pace of life. Um, but also the kind of thing where I was like 20 or 21 when I moved there and lived there for like six months. So as far as a education on a different way of life that element was awesome but um living in australia i mean like you said it's similar to the united states uh but in my opinion of sort of like an improved upon version and the cities there are a lot of the most livable cities in the world uh, and australians are like really cool and funny and unique people so uh you know i, I loved it so much there i tried to immigrate that didn't work out to me and you know in some ways it's a good thing in some ways it's a bad thing i mean i would have never ended up with the wpt and had a lot of the experience that experiences that i've had uh here in the united states and then like traveling the world after if i stayed in australia um but there's a part of me that always kind of wonders what if i had gotten permanent residency and then citizenship down there and it changed everything it is kind of a it, i do recall it to be kind of idyllic compared to it just, at least Melbourne just seemed like almost the perfect city. I, I think uh, it is. I think it's the perfect city. It was one of the best cities I've ever been to. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I find it really funny that you shifted from there to not even like downtown Shanghai, like the more obscure parts of all right. the things. Yeah, um, like just out in, the, out in the middle of the sticks in Shanghai. 
That's too funny. I didn't think you'd be that kind of guy. That sounds like something I might do. Uh, coming from like, I'm, well, I came from like almost the middle of a kind of a random place from India to mm-hmm. record this podcast as a matter of fact. But, uh, why, uh, why are you in India right now? Oh, I'm in an ashram. I'm meeting, uh, well, uh, let me back up. I'm uh, on the spiritual path. Uh, I see. It's a little bit of a long story. Do you have any, um, well, I could see you potentially going down, down that route. It doesn't seem, I don't know. Do you have any experience in that? Spirituality? In pursuing it more actively, like traveling to India and these kinds of things. Uh, to my knowledge, you don't, but maybe no. you do. Doesn't, no. Doesn't interest me at all. Just not uh, an aspect of life that I focus on at all. All right. Well, let's ignore that. A little bit too, very wild. Uh, Or can be. Anyway, well, so what was it that, I guess you just decided to travel the world from uh, China. Um, It sounded like you were doing it not just for the money, but also for the experience of traveling to all these places. Is that right? hundred percent. Yeah. I, uh, always loved that aspect of the poker lifestyle or playing for a living. Like you could just kind of look at a map and see where they were having tournaments and then create excuses to visit that place and places close to it. So that was something I used to love to do when I was traveling internationally more. I was like, okay, I'm going to go play a tournament in Spain, but there's also a couple of countries next door that I've never been to. So like, let's carve out some extra time and go explore those places. And I did that all over the world for more than a decade. And uh, there's just not many professions that allow that kind of remote working flexibility. Um, I guess it's a little more common now that we've made a shift in that direction, but certainly in like the mid aughts, it was really uncommon. Um, And I always wanted to see the world, always wanted to travel. And above all, I wanted to do it when I was young. Like I, I grew up in the Midwest and I definitely remember talking to people older than me when I was in my teens and they were like, oh man, you know, I wish I had done all that stuff before I got like married and bought a house and have a mortgage and have kids. And like now maybe one day when I'm 65 or 70 and I'm retired and I've saved up enough money and my kids are in college, I can do that stuff. But then you're at an age where often your body doesn't acclimate to travel very well. You know, you have sleep and health problems and so forth. So I just feel really fortunate that I got to have those experiences while I was young. Yeah, it is really hard for a lot of people to do that kind of thing. Um, I, I have done it a bit. I mean, a bit, I mean, for all sorts of different reasons. Um, how did you find uh, adjusting to all the, the travel? Like, you, I mean, living out of a suitcase, I personally find it to be challenging. But uh, oh, for, sure. for you, oh, was, was there just was the, the, the thrill of traveling and seeing all these new places, like, clearly... Uh, could they transcend that or was, were there challenges involved in traveling as well? Uh, there's always challenges, but the benefits easily outweigh the costs. Um, of course, you know, <laughs> when you don't have an address, there are certain people, uh, certain, you know, like, you know, if you have to do your taxes or stuff and documents come to your house, you don't have really like a house to send them to, you know, there are little problems like that that accumulate when you don't have a set residency. Um, Anytime you need to like replace something that can be very challenging, especially if you're talking about, you know, electronics, for example, like you might not find in the country that you're visiting, you can even replace the part that is missing to your computer or your setup or whatever it is. Uh, Of course, there is the jet lag element. Um, When I would first make large jumps across an ocean or something, it would take me almost a week to get acclimated to the new sleep schedule, especially if you're traveling you know, from the United States, heading east to like Europe or Africa or the Middle East or something like that. I found that to be a brutal change in hours and uh, man, it would just mess up my digestion and stuff. So there was, there's definitely challenges along the way, but also like none of them that ever outweigh the benefits of getting to live that lifestyle. Yeah, that is one cool thing about poker is it takes you to all these crazy places. Um, yeah. I, uh, why don't you go, what, what were the benefits that made it all worthwhile? What were like some of the biggest highlights of uh, your travels, the best places that, you, that you've been to, 
that sort of thing. Uh, the expansion in your perspective and worldview, the empathy you gain for people coming from all different walks of life, all different nationalities, um, your increasing depth and understanding of history, world history. I think in the United States, we often have a pretty um, united uh, America-centric worldview. Uh, I think a lot of Americans, because it's like, it's kind of inaccessible to travel as an American to like a really different culture. I guess you can go to Latin America and even that's like not all that close for much of the States or you can go to Canada and everything else is like crossing an ocean. Um, so it can be hard to have, uh, to import that kind of cultural experience uh, as opposed to some other place. Like if you're in Europe, you know, there's like what 50 different countries that are a train ride away. If you so choose, you know, the, your access to different experiences and worldviews is so much more is so much closer. Um, so there was that element. There's the social element, and now having done that, I have friends all over the world. And if I was going to drop into some place, there's probably someone I could reach out to from my past, and it would be great to, to catch up, or you know, to have them. If I had friends that I was traveling with now, to have them help show us this place. Um, and just, yeah, you know, like the, the, the memories of all this. I mean, when you're younger, of course, you, you know, you go out partying, you meet people, you meet girls, you have all that kind of experience and it's super fun. Um, and the, the poker itself, I mean, like I've played poker in, I, 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 would, I would have to go and check. Like, I don't know how many countries I've played poker in anymore. Uh, the, and poker is like a very different game in different countries and locales. Uh, there's certainly a vibe to American poker to depending on where you are in Europe, there's like you know, there's almost a regional vibe uh, or just really? a di different distinctive country for sure. For sure. I guess, and, I, can, uh, I, guess I could see that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Even in the United States, like you can, you can feel some degree of regional difference. Like there's a big difference between the vibe and energy in a tournament room at the Borgata in Atlantic city on the East coast and one in California or Las Vegas. Uh, oh, sorry. So, you've been to Atlantic city. Oh, it's, it's, it's okay. It's all right. And it's, okay. <laughs> it's actually a great place to go play poker. I wouldn't necessarily recommend Atlantic City as a vacation destination, but the Borgata as a tournament stop was actually, I always kind of looked forward to it, strangely enough. And yeah, you know, nobody, nobody talks up Atlantic City, um, but the Borgata did a nice job and their events were fun. And I liked the East Coast energy. It was a loud and talkative style of poker. It was a little more emotional than we see in a, a lot of the United States. And uh, it was entertaining. All right. I'm curious about these other sort of uh, uh, vibes from mm -hmm. the other places that you've experienced. I think I know what you mean. But why don't you tell the audience a little bit about what, what the differences are? I mean, I would just say some things that were really distinctive to me. In Australia, I was there during their poker boom. It was a few years after the one in the United States, and especially because Joe Hashem won the World Series main event in 2005. They experienced a really big poker boom, but Australia is also kind of small, so there was only so many places to play poker. So it really felt like when you were in Crown Casino's poker room, you were in like the very center of the very mecca of Australian poker and anybody who wanted to play would come down and play with us. So like, you know, Australian celebrities like Shane Warren, for example, who's, you know, a cricket legend and a guy who unfortunately passed away recently. I mean, he'd be just, he'd just come down there and play with us. It was just like such a, a hangout. It was such a social vibe in Australia. Like you'd start with poker and then you'd go out afterwards. Um, in China, what really stood out to me was the larger female percent of the, the larger percent of the field being female than almost anywhere else. Like really? I, I haven't played that many tournaments in China, but the ones I have play, it, played, it really stood out to me that like in America, poker by percentage is a man's game. It's like it's like 95 or 97 percent male. Like if you look at the World Series main event players, you know we get like six, seven thousand players every year, and like 300 of them are female. And in China, it felt like 20, 25% of the field was female. Um, so that really stood out to me. Uh, That's crazy. I, I haven't right. seen that, but I presume you're right. I haven't really played any tournaments in China or um, too many tournaments in Asia. I've been there mostly for the cash games. Yeah, that, that certainly stood out to me. Um, and then there's also just like weird little experiences that come on along the way. Like I played a tournament in Korea once. 
where the government came and <laughs> shut down the tournament on like day two or day three because it was running in a convention space and not in a formal casino space and that either violated some form of gaming law or they used it as an excuse to shut it down for other reasons. And so they literally like, we had to move the tournament into the casino, but then the the Filipino dealers that had been dealing the tournament in the convention space didn't have a license to deal in the casino. So like random Korean people, not full blown randoms, but like border, like people who busted out of the tournament had to be conscripted into dealing the tournament shortly after like weird stuff like that happens. Um, you know, certainly across Europe, there's a very different vibe. Like there's a very different vibe between a tournament you play in Barcelona and a tournament you play in Nottingham in the UK, where I played a bunch when I was working for party poker. And then like one that you would play in Germany, um, the same way that they have, you know, cultural differences between those places. It very much shows up in the environment that you play around. Um, so it, yeah, getting a glimpse into that side of poker and how the culture around it differs in places, the customs around it differs in places uh, was really cool a really cool part of that lifestyle i'm gonna have to pay more attention to that as i travel uh one thing i remember specifically was that uh, i think that american players tend to get a bit more upset when they lose compared to europeans maybe it's like more of a european thing to have manners than america the uh, than in america that's my guess but i'm not really sure i have to like really look closely that's just i've just remembered so many like outbursts coming from american players or just like displays of uh, being upset that were more obvious. Maybe it's, uh, what do you think of that? Um, I don't have a strong opinion on that take, but I think that generally gels with my experience. I would say, you know, in, in the more emotional leaning countries in Europe, you might see people get a little more upset over their bust out. And then there are some more reserved cultures in Europe where you would basically like never see it. Um, and yeah, in the United States, there's a, a certainly a degree of pride that people have intertwined with their poker abilities. And when they lose, sometimes their pride or the ego is uh, slighted. Um, but yeah, I couldn't really say strongly one way or another. Okay. I'm not sure myself, but I'm going to look out for these uh, different vibes and all that sorts of things. I'm, I'm a bit curious to see what the differences are because I'm thinking of playing more tournaments lately myself. Um, uh, one thing uh, I do, one thing I really learned myself while I was, as I was traveling, as well as from reading, is that uh, as you were saying, that the history of like the rest of these places is like far, far more diverse and deeper than what you learn in America. And uh, one funny thing about history that at least uh, appealed to me was that there's all sorts of crazy stories that you would just never imagine. If you like uh, develop kind of a an inclination towards stories, or you talk with the locals, or whatever, uh, like that was what appealed me to history. And uh, um, did you find that to be an interesting subject as you traveled, or was it more like the locals that you met and the people that you met kind of thing? Um, yeah, I loved going out of my way to see you know art or architecture history in these places when when there was enough time uh, away from the tournament. Like I really enjoy going to any cultural sites nearby or even going to just like the, the museums, getting tours, uh, having the tour guides fill you in on why the exhibits there were so important to the local history. Um, yeah, that was, that was among my, my favorite aspects uh, of that travel. Um, and so, yeah, I've been, I've been lucky to see some incredible historical sites in my time. Like I, I always wanted to see uh, Hagia Sophia in Istanbul and uh, just thought that that was like, an, you know, such an, an incredible piece of multicultural history. Like so many different cultures have washed over Istanbul in its, you know, two millennium of history there. And that specific site has had so much meaning to so many well, I mean, to two major religions and uh, a multitude of historic societies. And like, I, I got to see that when I was, geez, you know, let me think about this. 
23, 24, or something like that, you know, on a, on a poker trip that went through the Mediterranean um, on top of other sites in Istanbul. So just like having the chance to tick off the boxes and all these places that I had heard about growing up um, or had some like vague idea of what they were and what their meaning was to that place and then getting to see them in real life. Like, man, that's, you know, among the very best parts of playing poker for a living. Okay. It sounds like you know more about uh, the Hagia Sophia than me. I had no idea, but like some of these places have this, uh, yeah, some of them have like crazy histories behind them. And I, it, yeah. yeah, it would probably be a bit more interesting. Like so, certain ones I uh, was really looking forward to myself. I'm trying to think. Um, Chad, well, why don't you go ahead, actually? It sounds I mean, like you do a bit about history. Yeah, I mean, there was Hagia Sophia, which is like, it's just an incredible building, like both inside and outside. It's an incredible building, and it's just like kind of on top of this hill in Istanbul overlooking the Bosphorus and all the boats and the sea. Um, I was fortunate. It wasn't for a poker trip, but when I was traveling a lot, I was fortunate to see Machu Picchu, which is just like you know, an incredible world heritage site. Um, certainly throughout Europe. I mean, Europe is just like drenched in history and architecture. It's like a living museum for an American, right? Because our history, while interesting, you know, our um, Western history only goes back, you know, a few hundred years. There's certainly a much deeper and longer indigenous history. But in, in Europe, I mean, their architectural history is still so well-preserved in many cities, I mean, especially you go to like Prague or Vienna or Paris, despite the fact that you know, there was multiple wars that struck Europe in the 20th century, um, those places were remarkably well preserved. And uh, just going and touring the, the buildings and hearing, you know, oh, the, you know, the Medici family built this, uh, this church or this building uh, 600, 500 years ago, whatever it was, or... Um, you know, getting to see the canals, of Venice. Um, I mean, like you could just, you could really go down the list. I mean, uh, you know, one of the, the largest mosques in the world in, in Morocco or, I mean, even, and even some like newer history, like Dubai was a place that I was always fascinated by. And it has a much more recent history because they've only had the oil resources necessary to build that place up over the last 60 ish years. And I mean, even in like the 1990s, Dubai was, was mostly desert and then it just like sprung up out of the desert into this massive cosmopolitan place with so much money and decadence and um, people from around the world and everything like getting to see places like that just always fascinated me. So, you know, the history there is very modern. Like I was there just as they were finishing the Burj Khalifa. It's only 10, 15 years old, but seeing places like that always fascinated me. I find it funny that, uh, you know, the middle of deserts uh, turns out to be a bit of a hot spot of sorts, especially if you're decadence. Right. It's, it reminds me of Vegas in a lot of ways. And there's certainly a lot of parallels as cities that don't really like belong where they are considering the environment springing up out of the desert and becoming these massive tourist sites with enormous buildings. Who would have thought? <laughs> it, is, uh, it is funny how some things work out. Well, uh, yeah, I didn't imagine you'd be so into that kind of stuff. But um, I guess it makes sense because you... Always, uh, you struck me as more of an open-minded kind of poker player. Um, definitely, you had a different way of doing things that seemed uh, a bit more uh, mature, not just purely based in poker. Like, you're always dressing up in suits. And, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, you were um, the host of WT, which requires a different variety of skills completely than um, playing poker. It's like you were need more social skills and you also have to get to that uh situation as well um can you go into did, did your travels have any influence on how you like developed as a person in the sense of like uh through your poker career uh, i know that you had some i know that you had uh an interest in self-development as well mm -hmm. yeah definitely I, I would say a lot of poker players um play poker because they absolutely love poker and games and strategy. 
I generally play poker more as a means to an end. Um, I do like poker. I, I'm 20 years into my profession and I still like study it and, you know, uh, like to watch major tournaments to digest the strategy of it. But I, I do think that a lot of the poker players I encounter are more in love with games than I am. Like, I know they are. I'm just really, you know, like most poker players, like great poker players I know, they're like super into chess. Bro, you couldn't pay me to play chess. Like, I, I don't I don't give a damn. Um, you know, like it doesn't, you know. It, to me, like, oh, I have to sit here and, like, figure out this game and think really hard. Just, like, no. Um, whereas the lifestyle elements that poker gave me access to, uh, the ability to, like, travel, have those experiences, or, like, you know, uh, wear the kind of clothes that I wanted to wear, go to the kind of places I wanted to go, hang out with the kind of people that I wanted to hang out with. Like, it was sort of the, the world's your oyster was my feeling towards poker. And it was this, like, awesome game I discovered that, that created – a created the potential to do those things but to me most poker players i know and actually really the best poker players i know they like they just deeply love games and strategy and i just yeah for whatever reason i, I lack that to me it's like i said it's much more a means to an end i do really like poker i've always loved being a part of the poker and gambling world i mean even more than like poker itself i just love being a part of the gambling world it's just such <laughs> a cool profession to me um, and I just love being in a world where anytime like you make a statement, like I, I think this, someone's like, oh yeah, I'll bet you. And we'll figure out very quickly, like who knows what they're talking about and who means what they say when you have to put your money up. And that, that might be my, like my literal favorite part about being in gambling, because we live in a world now where with social media, like everybody's a hot take artist. Everybody's an expert on every subject everybody's got a take on this. And when you have to put money behind your words and actions, it's a real guiding light to who actually knows their stuff and who actually means what they say and who's just talking out their ass. Yeah. I, I, when you were talking about how poker players like put their money where their mouth is, uh, I can see that being more of the case in poker, although I, I, I like how you uh, clarified a little bit with like, actually, you can see who's full of shit and who's not, because there's plenty of poker players say a bunch of stuff and they don't actually like put money behind it. Uh, there should be like a, in my opinion, there should be like a bullshit tax. Uh, <laughs> should, who collects the tax though? That's the problem. Like who's the, who's the government in this hypothetical uh, well, that's the difficult part. I mean, what you could do is you could create like, I mean, I think it'd be cool if like there's some kind of community that actually agreed to like do things based off of like, you have to bet money on it somehow. I mean, that would be amazing. Uh, yeah, ultimately the like tax, huh? I was going to say, ultimately the tax is on your reputation, right? If you're a person who's known for like saying lots of stuff that they won't back up with their money, like the rest of us as a community kind of roll our eyes at you. But if you're someone who like is cautious with what they say when it comes to hot takes or sensitive subjects, and then you come down with a real strong opinion on something and people are like, well, this guy, he doesn't say anything unless he's willing to back it up. Like we collectively take you more seriously. Well, that's how it should work. I think it sort of yeah. works that way ultimately, but in a very disorganized sort of way. Um, right. I mean, this is probably how like, karma works out there's an element of gambling and karma uh, mm -hmm. think about it but that's that's another subject um yeah i would have imagined that you'd be more on the gambling side or be more be more interested in being part of the gambling community but it does make sense that uh for whatever reason in poker uh, it for some reason there's a there's just it just seems like there's less nonsense than in other sectors you can say um somehow as you as you were alluding to yeah uh, like, i don't have much work experience outside of poker and gambling except for entertainment and i, I definitely yeah. when i'm amongst the entertainment crowd i'm just like man i wish you people had to bet on your on what you say i oh i wish you know Can like you, uh, share some takes from that share some information I know a little bit about entertainment, but uh, I know the, it's not like super, I don't have a super wide uh, amount of information. 
I mean, ultimately, my take on the entertainment world is it's the attention economy. And so whether what you say is like credible doesn't matter at all. It's whether what you say gets eyeballs and gets engagement. And that's how it's valued. Um, so being someone who's like cautious with your words and doesn't deliver a, hot, a lot of hot takes and tries to speak in you know uncertainties or a more probabilistic sense, like to give you an example... Just last night, we've had this crazy situation on the stream game uh, where there may or may not have been cheating in this crazy hand that played out. Um, I don't I know if you that hand, it. was insane. Yeah, the hand was insane, and there may or may not be something nefarious going on there. And I think that anyone who says with a certainty it definitely was cheating or it definitely was not cheating um, – I don't think that's a very viable opinion. Like we're, we're dealing in uncertainties here in the attention economy. Like you do not deal in uncertainties. You give your hot take and people engage with it. And the more engagement you get, the better it is. And it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. And you don't have to put anything behind it. And it doesn't even matter if it's later proved that you are wrong. So long as you got the engagement and attention mission accomplished, you're, you're a good entertainment person. You did your job. That's what you get paid for. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It doesn't matter if you're accurate. It doesn't matter if you're credible. Um, so that would be kind of like my complaint with the, the entertainment world and, and one of the many reasons why I don't really feel like outside of doing something like the World Poker Tour, I'm, I'm a great fit for it. There have been times in my life where I thought like, hey, maybe I would expand my career in broadcasting or entertainment. And I like dip my toe into that world and very quickly I was like, no. Nope. I was just like, no, nope, I am not built for this. Like, I'm, I'm really just not. I, I actually think I'm really well built to be a professional gambler because I, I don't mind losing. Like, I handle losing really well. I lose money all the time. And I'm like, okay, not my day. Not, not a big deal. And, like, I don't suffer the way a lot of people do emotionally when they lose. It's, you know, losing is brutal psychologically on most people. And I'm fortunate that I just is it though? doesn't. I mean, like, this. I mean, absolutely, like, bro. I guess I shouldn't talk. I had, like, a little bit of meltdown earlier. Um, I mean, like there's all sorts of different forms of losing. If you think about it, I mean, probably people are a little better. Oh, I'll rephrase losing money for the vast majority of people, especially if they're inexperienced at it is psychologically brutal. And there've been all those like studies and tests that say that the, the emotional or psychological response to losing is something like two to three times as strong as winning. Um, and in my experience, I believe that to be true. I know a lot of poker players who are sort of like parentally miserable because it is their job to show up and then just like get beaten down in tournaments and lose again. And, you know, it just kind of keeps them in a constant state of misery. Um, I think they need go ahead. And and so I just feel that I, for whatever reason, like my brain chemistry was well suited to gambling where I can just kind of see things long-term. And when I lose, I like, I swear, and then I'm over it, you know? Like, I take my bad beat, I'm like, damn it, oh, you know, beep, 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 and then I'm like, all right, you know, and then I sleep like a baby, and I wake up the next day, and I feel fine, I'm, I'm ready to get back after it. Um, and uh, whereas with the attention economy, like, I just, just don't have the character traits necessary to engage in that very well. Um, there are other people in poker who play that game really well, um, and if that's your priority and you do it well, then I guess congrats to you. But um, it's not something that interests me very much. Well, I don't blame you with that. I mean, definitely there's, I mean, I somewhere down, deep down, well, it's not that hard to see it, but I view people who try to get attention through doing that to be a little bit, um, if that's like their whole game, you know what I mean? If that's like their whole angle, to yeah. be like, it's, it's asinine. It's um, cringy. Although I, I do it on purpose because I know that it manipulates in a certain way. Uh, if that makes sense. But I like look at it all as like a joke. If that, if that makes sense for me, I would just be saying, if I did it, it would be me saying everything as a joke. It's like, it right. like a different variant of my personality, but like fundamentally I'm similar in that most of my statements, if I'm really talking in terms of truths and stuff, are going to be probabilistic and not necessarily sound like super confident or whatever. But um, I mean, that's, that's really how, like in my view, that's the way that, you know, will benefit more in the long run. Unless all you care about is entertainment or being entertained. If that yeah. makes sense. So, 
you, you asked for examples, and I, I thought of one that uh, this kind of leaps to mind, and I guess would say the difference in priorities and perspective. I uh, I was at an event. One, I don't want to get too into specifics because I like you know, the people involved in the story are people that I like, people that I, I really enjoy. But still, like there's a different in mindset here, and and you'll see it. So I was at a, a social event, and we were in kind of a, I guess you'd say an exclusive section of this event. And uh, Larry Fitzgerald, the Hall of Fame wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals, one of the greatest wide receivers of all time, one of the greatest football players of all time, he was there. And uh, someone pointed out that he was there. And I was like, that's so awesome. I've heard he's always a gentleman. I really want to go over and meet him and say hello. So I did. I went over. And predictably, Larry was nice as can be, total gentleman, took a picture, you know, gave anybody in the room that, that wanted time with him. Uh, he gave that time to them. He was super cool. And uh, so I went over and I got a picture. And then some of the people that I was with also went over and got a picture. And when they were done, they came over to me and they said, so Tony, who was that? And I was like, I was like, the fuck is wrong with you? Like, why are you like, I was like, why are you asking somebody for a picture if you don't even know who they like? I, it was, you know, to post it on social and get the engagement and everything. But I was just like, what? Like you, you know, this is so alien to me. That you would do that. It kind of makes like, sense if you think about it. I mean, it makes sense from a certain perspective. Oh, it totally like makes sense. I just mean, I, I I can logically see how they came to the conclusion of like, oh, that's somebody famous. I should get a picture with them. There's going to be We're engagement right. for me. But like, from my perspective, I was like, the hell is wrong with you? You know, it sounds like your ways of doing things aren't exactly the same as... Most people in the populations, most people in the populations are like, oh, cool, fame, oh, cool, uh, right. hype, oh, what's that? And, and it sounds like you're, you know, you choose people more based off of some intrinsic truth about them, it sounds. You value something. You, when you value people, it's more based off of some kind of intrinsic, intrinsic truth that's uh, related to yourself. Would you say that's true? Yeah, absolutely, man. Okay, well, yeah, I think it's a better way of doing things for sure, but you know. Uh, people are gonna do their thing. Um, I mean, uh, I'm, would you say that your style of reporting uh, really, um, your style of, how do I explain this? That your style of talking about poker and things like that really resonates. Uh, would you say that poker players tend to be more uh, probabilistic, more in interested in intrinsic truth? Or um, what is it that you think uh, makes you, uh, how, excuse me, um, you know, what, uh, how would you compare reporting for the raw deal, or excuse me, well, you were on the raw deal, and mm -hmm. you were on for, uh, on a, in the host for WPT as well. How would you say that differs from, uh, from like typical reporting? Can you just state the truth or can you, like, do you have to, um, how does that work for you? Yes, I think you can generally state the truth. And part of the reason I really like poker broadcasting and doing commentary with the World Poker Tour is it is like, it's genuine and authentic for me to like have an interest in poker and to talk about poker and to try and dissect what I think is good poker and bad poker for reasons X, Y, Z. Um, and there is definitely a priority on truth telling and just giving your natural opinion. But you also do have to be sensitive to the fact when doing commentary that like, hey, poker's hard and sometimes people screw up and making them look really bad at a vulnerable moment for them in the public eye is not always fair. And like people have reason, like even if somebody like puts you to hand, you know, there's often some rationale behind what they did that's actually like pretty reasonable if you let them articulate that or maybe they had a read that went into that spot so i try and be sensitive to the fact that like mistakes happen but also honest about the fact that that was a mistake and that was a bad play for reasons xyz um without just like outright jumping down someone's throat uh one thing i regret a little bit about my like earliest years in commentary and in the public eye and pokers i think i was just like a little too eager to try and like you know slam people for how they screwed up a hand and ha 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 like you know you messed it up um you know here's why and the longer i've been in the commentary and hosting role the more i'm like mm, 
you know, trying to have some empathy where people are at, you know, tell the truth about when someone has made a mistake and why you think from a strategic standpoint, that's a mistake, but like, don't just, just jump down their throat and say, everything's terrible. And oh my God, this person's a dog and they don't get it at all. And oh my God, what a bad player. Um, I, I don't really want to, to take that route, but I also do feel frustrated sometimes when I watch poker and commentators like completely gloss over and sugarcoat a bad play like when something was just a flat out bad play and they're just like well you know he made a read and i'm like "Mm, nah like bad plays bad play sometimes bro like that's just what it is um i try and find a balance there and uh yeah i think that it is best to both be honest about what you are seeing in front of you but also have empathy for the people in the game it's a careful balance. It's hard to, yes. um, it's like the, at least to me, it's the, the, the it's important to balance the, the truth with the don't hurt people's still feelings things. I feel like, actually, I feel like these days in the U S people are more on the side of don't hurt people's feelings. Um, yeah. And the whole, especially in the West coast is like kind of a thing where everyone's just like full of shit all the time. And, some That's reason. what I kind of loved about East Coast poker is they were, they were just like call each other dogs and like unleash on each other. And then like two minutes later, it's all fine. You know, like everyone's just grown up saying what they believe and speaking their minds that everybody else around them has very thick skin. So when we talked about Borgata poker earlier, like that would flare up in Borgata poker. Like people would just like get into it and be shouting at each other. And then like two minutes later, it's fine. And I found that very, very amusing and endearing. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely much more a fan of that kind of communication style than like not hurt, hurting people's feelings. Um, I view it to all be selfish, to be honest. Uh, unless it's, I understand it a bit more when it's, it makes, it's not selfish when you're, you're trying to defend someone on the stream. I mean, that's a little bit different because, you know, they're in the public eye. And yeah. That kind of thing. I actually imagined you to be, uh, how do you say, well, a gentleman, but also I, for some reason, imagine it to be like, really like, uh, how do I say more of like your, uh, like I, I would have imagined you at ever at any point, like totally blasting someone's play on the stream. That just didn't seem to suit your character. And also you're, you dress in suits quite a lot, but do you still do that? Uh, not as much as I used to, both because I live in Vegas and it's like 110 degrees all the time here and I like live in the suburbs. So where am I going in a suit? Um, and also because as, as I've spent more years in the public eye, uh, it has sort of accrued attention and like wearing the suit is probably the best way for me to get recognized. And I don't, I don't mind being recognized or have people come up to me. Most people are like really nice and, and, uh, you know say, Hey, you know, I, I like the show and I'm like, Oh, thanks. And that, you know, that's about it. But, um, I'm kind of introverted and sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming and wearing the suits can encourage that kind of attention and I'm not always up for it. Um, so I prefer to like suit up in my private life more than in poker these days and around casinos. Um, and I don't, I, I didn't slam people on commentary as much as I used to a little bit when I would, when I started out the raw deal, I think I had this mindset that I was like, yeah, you know, you've got to burn people. You got to you know, lay down, you know, lay down the stick. Yeah. Thing, but the yeah. And then, um, and then also like when I was very active on like the forums and in the early days of social media, yeah, I just kind of had more of this mindset of like, you gotta, you gotta get people with a burn, you know, that'll, that'll show them, that'll get the juices flowing. And I've definitely shied away from that as my career has gone on. Okay. That's interesting. I didn't realize you would, uh, yeah, I didn't realize you had, uh, changed in that kind of way. I just thought for some reason that you always had good manners and that sort of thing. Um, in person for sure. But I feel like when I was on camera, I used to think like, well, I got to perform, you know, I got you know, to give the people what so they hard. want. I got to give them something to talk about. And then, yeah, increasingly over time, I've tried to tone that, that side down. But as I said before, well, like keeping it honest, if I see a bad play, I'm like, well, that was pretty bad for the following reasons. Well, like, Hey, we all make mistakes. So how did you get on, uh, what was it? Yeah. How did you get, how did you be, end up becoming the host of WPT and also hosting the raw deal? 
Uh, it started with open auditions for the Raw deal. The World Poker Tour basically just did you know, broadcast that they were doing an open audition. People from mostly poker, but some from entertainment came and tried out. Um, like one of the more interesting ones to me was, do you remember, you've seen Borat, of course. Yeah. You know, the sidekick he had in that movie he was played by an actor named Ken Davaton, who was like the, you know, he was like the shorter, fatter guy. And, you know, they, there was that crazy scene where they like ran naked through the big banquet. And they're like fighting and screaming in Yiddish and whatever it was like that guy came and tried out for the raw deal, you know, like, so there was definitely both sides of the poker and entertainment equation that went out for it. But uh, I also tried out and I ended up getting the job. And I did the raw deal for about seven years until Mike Sexton, who had been the WPT's broadcaster and host for you know the entire duration and run of the show, he retired and moved on to a chairman role with Party Poker. And I was the one who was promoted and elevated into that seat alongside Vince Van Patten. So that's you know pretty much how that all played out. But it, you know it played out over nearly a decade. Oh, okay. And do you find, is that something that you enjoy or just did it uh, just to expand your career? Um, Very much enjoy it. I, I really love my job at the WPT and the people I work with are great and we get to go to interesting places. And it just, it coincides with my natural interests so well. Like I'm already going to travel and play poker tournaments and talk about poker a lot, study poker a lot. Like why not put it to use in a professional environment? So it, it's a great fit. And to be honest, I am running a little short on time. So while we're on the subject of the right. WPT, I want to shout out a couple of our upcoming events, especially here in Las Vegas where I'm at, which I'll definitely attend, starting with our Five Diamond World Poker Classic at Bellagio. That's going to be October 19th. That's been a 10K reentry for the entire 20 years of our show's run. It is essentially the oldest lasting WPT continual tournament. It's back at the Bellagio, October 19th. And then we're also really excited about our world champs coming up at Win in December. The main event is a $10,400 buy-in that's a 15 million guarantee, which is actually, surprisingly, the largest guaranteed prize pool in poker history. Uh, and that's true, not just marketing. Like, I, surprisingly, nobody's ever done more than a $15 million guarantee, and we're doing that with a 10K event at the win on December 12th. But we also have an $1,100 Prime Championship and an $1,100 Ladies World Championship in that festival throughout December that are also being televised. So there's going to be three televised events there. Everybody loves playing at the win. It's going to be an awesome series. Well, you actually got me a little bit curious there, uh, Tony. Go by, man. The, voice, yeah. the delivery was pretty good. The, yeah, no, I, you know, it's, it's authentic. Like, I don't, you know, I really don't mind doing any selling when I when it's stuff that I would totally go and do myself. It doesn't feel like, oh, I've got I've got to go and shill this thing. Like, no, I'm going to play the five diamond. I'm going to play the world champ. If the WPT fired me tomorrow, I'm going to be there. Like, those are great events. I'll be there, man. So yeah, usually if you like oh uh, some tournament poker, come by the world champs. Okay, well, the good a good salesman is authentic. Uh, we got yes. the good salesman and the 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 proper pitch. We even got to uh, how do you say? We got to see the they got a test of the announcement um, or how to the test. Excuse me, an example of the hosting right here. Um, yeah. I feel like that's a good um, yeah. It's good for uh, a good tie-in. Showing people want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know you do have to go in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else you'd like to uh, talk about before we go? No, I think we've about covered it, man. I, I wish you well on your spiritual journey and your travels in India and in other places. Uh, hopefully our, our paths cross uh, across the felt in the not-too-distant future. But, yeah, just wishing you good luck, good luck, good fortune out there, man. Yeah, they might just cross in the tournament you just talked about. That's right, <laughs> yeah. You hooked me on it. You're like, oh, 15 million. It's guarantee guaranteed. ever. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. the, the win. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. And uh, get to hear more of your uh, charming uh, voice on the, or when you're, um, or when you're, I can't think of the word, like broadcast. Is it broadcasting? Yep. How do you say it? Yep. WPT okay. is broadcasting on Valley Sports. 
plus a variety of other mediums where you can access the show uh, online and uh, through television. So we have a, just, we're in a ton of countries right now. So, um, you know, and if anybody's ever curious, hey, Tony, how do I, like, how do I watch the WPT and play XYZ? Tweet at me. I'm very, I'm very available on, online. Happy to answer questions people have about the show. All right, cool. Well, we'll make sure to uh, share some more information about you. Thank you for coming on the show, Tony, and talking a little bit about life and, uh, you know, where um, Poker's brought you and about broadcasting and all these sorts of things. Sounds good, man. Take care until next time. All right. Take care, Tony.